Welcome to the Latter-day Contemplation Presents Come Follow Me podcast. I'm your co-host, Abdul Haq, also known as Christopher Hurtado. I'm also co-host of the Latter-day Peace Studies Presents Come Follow Me and Latter-day Contemplation podcasts. In this podcast, I'm joined by my co-host and Sufi master, Sufi Al-Hajj Daoud, also known as Dr. David Peck. Dr. Peck is also the host of the Of Saints and Sufis, Musings of a Mormon Mystic podcast. On this podcast, we're sharing an actual master-disciple dialogue on scripture with little to no editing. I'm your co-host, Sufi Al-Hajj Dawood, also known as Dr. David Peck. The Sufi path is a spiritual, mystical, and contemplative practice often described as a journey. Universal Sufism is not a religion. Rather, universal Sufism is a spiritual path that welcomes persons of all religions or no religion at all. Our path is open to all, welcomes all, loves all. Sufi scripture study begins with a de-educational process that speaks directly to the souls of saints and Sufis and their scriptures. This study sets aside mere ethical or doctrinal readings through what Sufis call unlearning. This Sufi mystical approach enables one to see the scriptures afresh through spiritual eyes. We invite you to join our unfolding dialogue. Let the journey begin. Hello, Abdul Haq. It's good to be with you once again. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. It's good to be with you. Peace Thank be with you. Thank you. Wa alaikum as salam. I, I love our conversations, and I think we're going to have a, an exciting one from my perspective, at least today. Uh, our assignment is uh, First and Second Thessalonians, and uh, you've selected, uh, it's your choice this time, and uh, you've selected a verse from First Thessalonians 5, chapter 5, verse 23. Would you mind uh, reading that? That's right. Yes, I did. I selected this verse because there's something I saw in the second conject I wanted to talk about. But you wanted to talk about something in the first conject, and I'm, I'm okay with that. Let's do that. The verse reads, May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And that's where we're focusing. And may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, of course, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ does apply to both conjuncts, right? Correct. In fact, okay. I think we're going to touch on all of it, but you're right. Uh, the first and, and last uh, parts of it are what we're going to probably be focusing our, our attention on today from a Sufi perspective. So uh, we've got okay. some unlearning to do. Would you like to uh, maybe take us through the, the terms or words or phrases that stuck out uh, to you? Well, again, what first got my attention was spirit, soul, and body, that tripartite division of the self, I, can I say that, self, uh, of our persons. And, and yet, that's not where we're focusing. So that leaves us with sanctification, right? Entire sanctification, or a sanctification that is entire. And then this coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, whenever or whatever that Correct. means, right? And, and... But, but just for a second, just pause for a moment on when you said your spirit, soul, and body, uh, we can at least make a comment on that before we pass along, which I think is, we're starting to talk about, I, I suppose that um, as, a, uh, as a Sufi, I would say my being, right? My essential being, here it has it divided into at least three named uh, uh, aspects or parts of that being, and often uh, we tend to deal with just two. We think that the soul is a composite of two things, and this, just to point out at least that what we're going to call our essential being, or our, our, maybe even our soul of souls, right? This says soul as well. Our intelligence, that's probably a good word from a Sufi, that our intelligence uh, has at least these, these three aspects to itself. Well, and that, that intelligence, uh, you say, is a good term for us as Sufis, also applies to the Latter-day Saint tradition, where, again, you've mentioned the soul is usually thought of as the spirit plus the body. I guess that's why this verse stood out to me, because it has spirit, soul, and body, and it doesn't seem to line up with the Latter-day Saint. I was going to say theology, but it's more like soulology. I don't know the word. I don't know the, word. I don't know the right word to use. 
Yeah. Ontology, the study yes, of, being. of course, of course, ontology, the, 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 yes, the, the very nature of being itself. So I guess I think, you know, I've seen it in terms of spirit and body earlier in Paul, and now I'm getting this different configuration where I have spirit, soul, and body. So I think we'll come back to that. Yeah, though, right? I think we're going we're gonna to try to kind of work that into this uh, entire sanctification by the God of peace and, and what the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ might mean. You've identified, I think, some really dynamic uh, phrases here. And is it remarkable we find this in just this single verse? Well, uh, yeah, I think I think there might be. We might look at these terms or have the tendency to look at them ethically only, right? So, or in terms of like literal health, uh, that uh, you know, if you're sound mind and body, it means uh, I, I suppose that you're not suffering from some kind of dementia or mental impairment. Uh, uh, and sound would probably suggest that we're hale and hearty. Of course, then we'd have to apply that to the spirit and soul, and that would that couldn't be literal in the same way as it would be with the body, and so that wouldn't make sense in that way. So obviously, there's some kind of unlearning we have to do here to to understand even that term sound. The other thing that occurs to me, Sheikh, is we say we we started with assalamu alaikum, which is usually translated peace be upon you, and in that translation, it's not that different from a Catholic greeting. And it's and it's certainly no different from Paul's own greeting, which would have been shalom, although he does introduce a new greeting of grace. And he uses grace as though it were a, a shalom, right? He uses both at the same time. As a matter of fact, there there's a, an Arabic expression beyond just assalamu alaikum, which is assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, which I heard a lot living in Syria, which is to say God's peace, mercy, and blessings be upon you, which is such a beautiful expression. You know, when you're just walking down the street, especially late at night in the old city in one of these narrow uh, ancient uh, streets and, and you see some men and you, you always have this question. I, I never felt unsafe in Damascus ever, but there's always this question. Am I safe? Right? I'm walking up to a group of men. I'm alone. It's dark. And, and then I say, assalamu alaikum. And they come back with not only God's peace, but God's mercy and blessings be upon you. And I know I'm perfectly safe. But where I was really going with this is sound reminds me of salam because salam doesn't just mean peace. It means safety, wholeness, integrity, soundness, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it, and as is the case with many of these terms, salam finds itself uh, in in many, many iterations. Uh, the same word is the root of Islam, Muslim, you know, uh, and and on and on. It's the same in Hebrew or Aramaic, right? These there's a lot of flexibility to to these terms, and and it makes them very beautiful because they begin to permeate the entire language and culture with um, with an, a, a nuanced feeling or or a, a, a language to them. And they bring the presence of God into our lives in that uh, sense. We we at least invoke it when we say it, and if we say it with real intent, then why not? Why not? And uh, we become aware of the presence of God is how Sufi would look at it because remember for us that there's nowhere to go where God isn't. And so so the notion is, is it's our own heedlessness or our own distractedness. It's our own ghafla as we've talked about in, in previous episodes that keeps us for see, from seeing that we're already in the, the divine presence in, in a certain sense, right? While in the flesh, it's not the complete divine presence, but we are in the divine presence. Uh, so it's not that us invoking God in some way brings him present, but rather brings us present. Yes, our consciousness. We, we, uh, Sufis uh, always seek higher levels of consciousness, and as we begin to attain them, there's a real, there's a real profound uh, beauty to it because you just can't walk down the street like you used to before. You, it, you're just in a kind of a 
different place, a different world, we might say. Uh, and Sufis would say that quite literally. We're different, a different alam, right? We're in a different, uh, we're in a different world. Yeah, you know, that reminds me, we're recording this post general conference, October 2023 general conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And there was a talk mentioning holy places, listing buildings. And I thought, okay, sure, there there have been buildings, usually not LDS buildings, not even most temples, although some are exceptions for me, Nauvoo in particular. But usually I don't find God present to me, at least, in buildings. I, I rather feel God's presence more in nature. Well, that so, so remember we talked uh, also in a previous episode about the book of creation, which is written with the very words of the divine, right? The, the notion of let there be light should be a scripture in its entirety. You know, what is there in those divine utterances? There's, there's what, what is there in let there be? And what is there in light? And what is, and, and, you know, there's just, we, we forget that all of that light is found in every particle, in, so to speak. I mean, that electromagnetic force or whatever we want to call it is found literally in, in every, everything we touch and interact with, everything uh, surrounding us. And so as a Sufi, we seek to become conscious of that. And so it's, it's really a matter of higher consciousness, we might call it. That reminds me of a quote from St. Francis of Assisi. All the darkness in the world cannot extinguish the light of a single candle. I love it. I, exactly. I, so I have so much affection anyway for St. Francis of Assisi, but uh, yeah, Same brilliant, here. brilliant human being. And, and he's, the, he's the one, St. Francis was the one featured in the documentary of Saints and Sufis. No, sorry. The Sultan and the Saint. Did you see that, I, the Sultan I, and the I Saint? I know what, what the history of that is, but I have not seen that documentary. No, I, I, now I... Great documentary. I, I saw a pre-screening of it at BYU years ago, and it is the story of St. Francis and the Sultan. Let's see, he was the son or grandson of Salahuddin, known as Saladin. Is that how his name is said in English? Saladin. And, and he... Was it his grandson or son? Oh, uh, I... I the don't Sultan, remember right? exactly. So he's related right. he's, to Saladin, the famous... Right, because Saladin, of course, was, Saladin. he took Jerusalem back in, in the 1180s. And so for St. Francis of Assisi in the 1200s to meet, it would probably be at least a son or probably a grandson. Right. So the two of them meet. St. Francis goes out of his way and puts his life at risk, actually, to meet with the Sultan. And the Sultan also receives him gladly. And they stop. And this is in the middle of a of a war, right? In the middle of the Crusades. Uh, in the middle of a battle, even, and and they get together in the middle of a night, I guess. And is it's interesting that it's at, at night that this happens, and they talk, peaceably. It is a beautiful thing. And to follow up on sound, just very briefly before we kind of go on to some of these other things, just to uh, give a Sufi angle to this, we we'd have to deal with the mysticism of sound, which is very much a part of the teachings of Hazrat Inayat Khan, and many others, which is that um, sound is vibration, is action. And we may not be able to see the medium or hear it, right? We, we can't hear sounds elsewhere, but, but that, that vibration mo is movement, movement uh, is, is sound in that generic sense, and, uh, or in its root sense uh, of vibration. And uh, there's, a, there's an entire mysticism to that. And uh, I'll be kind of strange here for a minute. I, every once in a while, I, I'll go on to uh, like a YouTube or whatever, and I will look up the sound of the sun or the sound of Jupiter or the sound of Earth or the sound of all these celestial bodies are making sounds. And of course, we know the great uh, ancient mystic Pythagoras or Pythagoras, right? I'm sure, you know, we, we know that's... Right, he he said that we could hear the music of the spheres. He said he heard it himself a couple of times. Now, are we not equivocating though in speaking of this word "sound" in relation to? Yeah, yeah. Okay, this is where, as a Sufi, I, I let this first speak to me, and so it may, I I don't really ah, worry okay. about whether or not it was what Paul intended or the author intended. Can you? Can you compare that to Lectio Divina? That's the sense I get. 
Is that a Sufi way of, of reading? I think that, why not? I mean, I think that Lectio Divina is a really, really great uh, method or I guess hermeneutic for approaching the scripture as a meditative and spiritual act. And, and I think it's, it's uh, practiced widely around the world and it's been with the Christian tradition for thousands, you know, over, well over a thousand years and almost 2000 perhaps, I don't know. And uh, yeah, I think that's a great uh, recommendation. And we're kind of doing a, our own uh, Sufi meditation examination here, our own sort of uh, uh, a reading of this that would be comparable to that through unlearning. Unlearning then becomes the method. And uh, anyway, we don't, we don't really focus on whether or not Paul intended to teach me that. We, we go, what am I getting out of it? What is, what is this speaking to me? Lectio Divina would translate something like a divine reading. This is something that Riley and I have talked about on our sister podcast on Latter-day Contemplation. And Riley even started a group on Facebook uh, called Lectio Divina. Oh, that's wonderful. And I, and I think it could benefit all of us very much. And I, when I was teaching um, at BYU-Idaho, I, I had a, a seminar opportunities. And I remember I had, uh, I think I taught three times the entire Divine Comedy, but I did it through an exegetical, which means a reading method pattern, which uh, was the Four Senses of Scripture, which is uh, very, very similar to Lectio Divina, but except Lectio Divina has uh, a, a, a meditative spiritual aim to it, whereas, whereas the other may or may not, depending on how you do sort of the Four Senses of Scripture. But... Um, Right. I, I guess to wrap up that conversation, this isn't really Lectio Divina we're doing. It just compares, right? Because we're not going to sit here and now meditate on this. Now you could, right? The listener could go and, and think about how sound might be read in this, what I call it, an equivocal way, right? And yet find some value in it. I'm reminded of the time that uh, Travis Patton, who was also a guest on Latter-day Contemplation, uh, and I taught the Divine Comedy together once. And we started off by reading a canto and then asking the students what they got from it. And it wasn't our concern whether what they got was what Dante intended. Now, we did let them know that's, that's what Dante intended or that's not what Dante intended. Or the greatest Dante scholar doesn't know any more than you do what Dante intended in this particular case, right? But I, I certainly believe that whatever whoever gets is valid for them. Yeah, that, 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 that opens up to likening the scriptures to ourselves. You know, we say that. We should liken the scriptures to ourselves. And I'm going, well, that means that it's going to be subjective, for one thing, or personal, at least personal. So we have to accept the fact that two persons may, may receive something entirely different out of the same verse. But yet, I sometimes feel there's resistance to that when I'm in meetings or other things where, you know, well, that's not what that means. And I'm going... Well, if you're going to say that you can liken them to yourself, then we need to have a lot of, uh, you know, liberality in accepting what other people have to say about it. And Sufis are good with that. Remember, whatever you speak from your soul and from your experience, that is what we say also. Well, we, yes, indeed. And we, we live and move and have our being in these contradictions, don't oh, we? Oh, absolutely. Because we're on different tracks in, in, a, in a personal sense. We may, there may be a generalized path of some sort that we're all following, but we're all taking our own steps. We're all avoiding obstacles or rocks, and we're all, you know, we have different sandals on or whatever, however, whatever metaphor you want to use for this. But the point is, it's, it's not really the same journey except in a broad way. Well, we're not even in the same place, right? I'm walking here in California, my Birkenstocks, and you're, you're up there in... Uh in Idaho, probably in snow boots, maybe not yet, but you're getting there. Yeah, we had hail last night, so, you know, it, it dipped down. But, uh, okay, so you're, you're right about all of this, and, and, and I think that's very important. And just to note, note that what we would call our intelligence manifests, or, well, it comprises, it comprises sort of different aspects of being, spirit, soul, and body in this verse, yet we, we, we keep wanting to cram them back. There's just two things, the soul and the body. 
and we want to differentiate between a body of flesh and blood and a body of flesh and bones, and maybe there is a big distinction there, but I think this is far more complex than that. There's one more thing I want to say about this. You said we, we want to make it the soul and the body, and I, I think that's true, although that may be confusing for Latter-day Saints. We've been taught as Latter-day Saints that the soul is the spirit, oh, spirit plus the body. body. Yeah. But that's right. Okay, there you go. So because, in, and I know why you made that mistake, and it's because in all other traditions, other than Latter-day Saint tradition, what we call, let's see, can I even get this right? It's confusing. So we're saying the soul is the spirit plus the body. Everyone else is saying the spirit and the soul are two different things, and the body right. is a third that's thing. That's what Paul seems to be saying. And Right. And what we call the spirit is usually the soul in other traditions. And am I getting that right? It, it becomes does become confusing. confusing because we haven't really worked through what these might mean. We just kind of use them, right? So, so I, I think that uh, theologically, that whole concept is pretty thin. Uh, that it hasn't received a lot of attention. I don't know that it really needs to receive a lot of attention. Again, for the Sufi, we pay it enough attention that we can understand the the workings of the spiritual path and of ourselves internally, in our interior self. I'm reminded of something else here, and that is, you know, as you've pointed out, when we do liken the scriptures to ourselves, it does become sub- subjective. It's personal, at least. And it's not really about the letter. So that's why this equivocation I speak of doesn't matter, right? It's not about the letter. And that reminds me of Paul, who tells us that the letter kills, the spirit gives life. The references that we see in the scriptures to the word of God are never self-referential. The word of God is not a text, not for the ancients writing these texts. The word of God is something living. And that's why once it's written down, it's dead letter. And what Paul wants is for the living word of God to be alive in our hearts, on the fleshy tablets of our yeah, hearts, he that's says. That's exactly right. And and of course, heart for Sufi is going to mean something entirely symbolical of a spiritual function that we have. And then, we, so sometimes Sufism can be confusing to, uh, broadly speaking, uh, Christianity, uh, especially non-Orthodox Christianity, uh, with these sort of, you know, less developed theologies of self, less developed theologies of being, highly developed theologies of ethics. But, uh, you know, when you get into that, you know, a lot of commandment work and and behavioral work rather than um, interior work in many of the traditions, it becomes hard to talk about because all of a sudden they're, they're awash in the complexity of our being and haven't really paid a lot of attention to our being. You know, to give the listener a heads up, you know, I have I've come down this path far enough that I could have learned by now not to get hung up on the terms, but it, we did have a pre-show conversation in which I got hung up on terms. And so I would say to the listener, don't get hung up on the terms. Just keep listening and listen, not for these words. They're dead letter, right? Not the words coming out of our mouths, but what the spirit speaks to you in your oh, heart. I couldn't agree with you more. We, we think that meaning is outside of us. Truth is outside of us. So when we say, what does it mean? It's that we, we all agree on a meaning. I go, well, that's what a dictionary is supposed to be, I, I think. You know, uh, you know uh, Daniel Webster writes it down and everybody has to accept him or, you know, whatever. We have to, we have to work with these external authorities. And of course, uh, one of the things you learn is all the things that were just slang in your youth become terms in a dictionary after a while and you're going wait a minute that wasn't really a term that's just slang and and uh, you realize wait a minute it became a part of that language because the language is living we we want to treat it like it's a fixed thing well but the sufi wants to say well who, who cares about whether or not the dictionary agrees on what something means that what does that have to do with my soul what does that have to do with my spiritual path that's the question and so we're constantly trying to rein in that tendency it's not that we ignore it. It's not that some of us might not be authors of dictionaries. It's not like we don't write glossaries. I do. I spend a lot of time in dictionaries myself as a translator. And, you know, I can't not say this. Yes, everyone knows Webster. But do they know Samuel Johnson? 
Webster ripped off his uh, 80% of his dictionary from Samuel Johnson whilst trash talking Dr. Johnson. Uh, and so, and we have an age of Johnson. There's no age of Shakespeare. Everyone knows Webster, Shakespeare. What about Dr. Johnson? We're always, and, and so the, the notion that w- what we're trying to do as a Sufi is we're not really worried about what it means out there. We're worried about what it's doing for, for our spiritual development interiorly. And so it's, it, it kind of, it's hard. It takes a while along the Sufi path for the person to really begin to make that transition. It's, it's another. It's a higher state of consciousness to where our external dealings become a way of examining our internal spiritual development. I'm going to say something from my soul, and I'm going to, and and I'm still going to couch it in terms that aren't even really that familiar to me. Why do I feel compelled to say physics tells us, right? Phys- I'm not a, f- a physicist, but I do have a soul. But there is this idea that everything is vibration, right? And so why can't the soundness of my body be in the vibrations within it, right? So the, so then the other sense of sound does apply Now you're talking like sense. a mystic, <laughs> which is... Which is what is the reality uh, of of my physical state, and how can I actually deal with that? And you find this in many traditions, the yogic tradition. Why Aum is a, is a sacred sound to them? It, it, you know, we would say, well, what does that mean? And and there are a lot of definitions of what it might mean, but the question is, what is it doing? I think for for Christians in general, and for Latter Day Saints in particular, it might be interesting to note that that Aum, that sacred syllable, right, is comprised of the first and last letter of the Sanskrit alphabet. The, the, so it's not that different from saying Alpha and Omega. So when we bring the two together, we're talking about everything, and that's what Aum means. It means everything that exists taken as a whole. And when you when you realize through higher consciousness and inner spiritual transformation the reality of om then you've made the progress mm-hmm. that that's in other words the external meaning is merely a guide to the internal transformation and the transformation of consciousness and that's that's what can be confusing along this path and, and it's why i use arabic terms i mean they, they, they because we've inherited arabic persian turkic mongolian urdu terms in sufism and others and, and these terms are in all of the literature and things, and I, I do introduce them so that people are not cut off from this vast corpus, vast corpus of literature and writing, but also that there's, there are effects of the sound on our mind, our spirit, and our body, and, and our soul. And so, yes, I can give a student the English equivalent of things, and I often do. They'll say, well, the Arabic is confusing, and I give them an English equivalent, but that's kind of not where we really are going with these the divine names, which are the names of both our soul and the names of the divine. Well, that reminds me too that scriptures, this idea, not just scriptures, but books in general, the idea of reading silently to oneself is a new idea. It's not new to the listener, right? But in terms of the existence of humankind, or the existence of reading, right? not the existence of humankind, but since there has been reading, reading has been something that's done out loud, and scriptures are meant to be read out loud. And the the Quran, you know, where we're getting these names of God, which again, we have names of God in the Bible too, I've mentioned that before, they are meant to be spoken, they're meant to be heard, not just seen silently. We're meant to vibrate with them, aren't we? You know that I've I've taught you in your learning wazifa meditation, which means chanting, and working with the divine names, and and of course uh, for Sufis the the Ibn Arabi said that there aren't ninety nine, it, it, it's infinite, but we have to discover the divine within that the infinitude of names. I have one more thing to say about the what you said and what Paul said too about the nature of the word of God, right? This, this living thing that isn't the dead letter. And that is even languages. Uh, ironically, when we do put things down into words and we, we make the dictionary, which by the way, you know, we don't have an academy in English. Other languages have an academy, French, Spanish, etc., And they tell you the prescriptive definition, right? Even Spanish has a descriptive dictionary, which is equal in stature to the descriptive one or the prescriptive one, I mean. But all of this changes. 
All of it changed. Despite the academies, despite the prescription, it changes because language is a living thing. And that's why these languages that have been attempted to be these universal fixed languages like Esperanto, they don't work. They can't work. Because, and there's another reason, because language is, has culture wrapped up in it too. And that's another reason why we're bringing these Arabic terms in, right? Because there's a culture of Sufism in the Arabic-speaking tradition that comes with it, right? It comes with the words. The whole culture comes with it. Absolutely. There's a whole culture to yoga of, and various schools of yoga, whether it's Hatha or Raja or whatever. There's a, there's a whole school to, uh, to the study of Japanese Zen, a whole school to the study of Chinese Zen. Uh, there's a whole school to Mahayana uh, Buddhism in its various permutations. There's a whole school to the dialogue of Latter-day Saints. If you don't believe it, just go uh, and go wonder what the many blessings are. Uh, you know, just listen to probably any given prayer, and we're going to say we thank thee for the many blessings. And you're going, what it, what does that really mean? And and for an outsider, I know as as a missionary and others, they, when they first came into that, they go, what are the many blessings? Is this a is this like a, a term of art? We thank you for, and that is it like a creed? Is it like because they keep hearing it repeated, and they'll go, oh, this must be the language of a liturgy or a creed or something, and I I just don't understand what the many blessings are. I'm just going to compare it to the Rami Emptum, and I'm going to say that the many blessings aren't the real mystery. The real mystery is who is dear and father. Yeah, dear. Well, see, we and we, you know, and I don't, I don't want to get in a position to where we we don't understand that people are 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 sincere in in doing their best because I think we we need to we need to see that and and accept it, but we need to be aware that we're doing it. I think too. That's I guess that's what I'm saying. And that's, yeah, that's really what we're saying, right? That we, we all have our mode in which we worship, right? And, and we have our set phrases. Even though we say we don't have set phrases, they do. Well, yes, we do. And we make fun of the, the people in the Ramiemptum. And then we are the people in the Ramiemptum. And that's inevitable. I mean, you know, because uh, the vanity may come from the unthinking nature of it rather than that it's vain because we, aren't, we don't do it with real intent. But we could do it with real intent. See, the, the question then becomes one that can't be answered from an external review because only the person saying it knows if they have real intent or not. Only God and that person know. And so, yeah, we, we Sufis, a lot of times we begin to let go of trying worrying about those things because we're just going, I, I have no idea what their intention is. How could I ever possibly explore whether or not another person has real intent? Only God and that person can know. And usually, even if that person doesn't know, God knows, and we can always go to the divine and ask, is my intention real? I mean, we can ask that really deep question. I think I have real intent. Do I really have real intent? When I tell my kids I'm doing this for your own good, is that real or I want them to shut up so I can read my book? Is my intention real? Am I actually doing it for their own good or am I doing it for my own good? Well, God can help us. That's a great question. This is what the Sufi path does. We begin to, we begin to strip off uh, these little questions, and then we can meditate on on who we are and what we're doing, and and we begin to develop a an attitude where I could go to. Uh, I mean, some people I know struggle with church meetings, or and and a lot of times uh, we get it to get to the point where we just let it go. I'm going. I I don't. I I'm not going to be offended by that well i see a term then here that that i haven't mentioned before may the god of peace himself sanctify you entirely right we there's probably some unlearning to be done there and by the way i don't know that that there's anything in particular i would need to unlearn because do i really know what sanctify means do i have a sense of what that means at all any more than spirit soul and body i think body i understand i'm going to tell you yes and no Here's here here is the no. Uh, we haven't we haven't er, er, the no is we think we would know it from a dictionary. The yes is I think you've experienced sanctification in your life, a and therefore when you feel that and you know it and, and you 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 take it back to the divine and you begin to open your your yourself up to uh, to your sanctified the experiences of sanctification then you will know, but you're, that's not an external knowledge. You're, what you're doing is you're building a vocabulary of self. 
You're building a syntax of self. You're building a language of self, and we call that the book of self. And, and you begin to understand what you're writing in your book. Most of our life, we're just putting stuff down. We don't even realize it, right? Every act, every thought, every whatever we have is an entry in that book, but it's just, I don't know what it would, my book would read like. 99.9% .9 of it would be gibberish. But there are those little uh, maybe pearls of great price in my life. That, and, and so I would say you do know what sanctification means in your life, in your experience, but who cares what it means on the externality? And so the Sufi master's job is to try to help the student if they want to know about sanctification, try to help the student bring out those experiences and explore them. That's, so we're, we're helpers. I have to say it, it would take an awkward pause to, to ponder that question uh, on a podcast. So I, I think we'll be talking about that offline. That's a really good question, right? What does it mean to me? What have my experiences been? I get a sense immediately as you say that that I, I do have experiences that, that I do, that resonates with me. What are they? I, I don't know that I could put them into words, even if I could put my finger on them in any sense. Well, but you know them. Yes, intimately. As, as humans, as we begin to turn our mind to the question of our own being, and we turn our heart to the question of our own being, and we turn our body to the question of our own being, we turn our soul to the question of our own being, that we find a rich storehouse of truth internally. And that's called marifa in, in Sufism, and we're going to chat just a bit about that. So let's, uh, let's move on then for just a second. Uh, <clears throat> we have this first phrase, may the God of, 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 from uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, I'll repeat it again to get it in our arm discussion and dialogue here. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. Himself. Which is the Sufi notion that this process of sanctification can take place with a master, with, uh, with another, with a messenger, but excuse me, ultimately it has to take place with the divine. And, and, and we, we can't get ourselves, we maybe even get to the top rung of the ladder, but we can't get ourselves off the ladder at the top. That, that, and we need help all the way, by the way. I'm not saying that this is all only on our own. No, the divine and other things have to help us there. But may the God of peace himself. And we would say, you know, that, that, that the gender in there is a linguistic, you know, holdover. But, but putting the language aside... <clears throat> may the divine sanctify you entirely because we, we, we're not going to be able to get up to the top and, and off that ladder of our own, our own selves. That's one phrase I want to put out there. The other one that I'm going to do, I'm going to go to the end now that, of First Thessalonians 5.23 and read again from the NRSV. At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, which we see as an external event, largely, right? We would tend to say, all right, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's this big event. And uh, for one group, it's going to be a big Armageddon. Of course, the second coming of Jesus is found within Islamic theology and in the Quran, right? That there's going to be a second coming of Jesus. Jesus is going to come back at the end of time again. And according to one group or another, do various things. He'll, he'll, he'll unify all religions so that we can present ourselves unified to God for judgment or whatever. There's all these theories about what that means. We're, we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the internal coming of this great messenger, Jesus Christ, into our being. Right? This is an internal esoteric process. I'm reminded of uh, a book by Yogananda, who was the man who brought sort of the Hindu tradition, uh, uh, the mysticism of the Hindu tradition to the West, just as the man who stands at the head of our Sufi order, Hazrat Nayad Khan, brought the Sufi tradition to the West. And he wrote a book, Yogananda wrote a book, I can't remember the title of it, but it's about the second coming of Christ within you. 
something that happens within us, not as an external event, but something personal. As a Sufi, I would say, okay, the first coming is the whole birth story that we all have, right? I mean, that, that's, or, or frankly, the creation. The first coming is, is still unfolding in, in an externality. It's still ongoing. It's not an event. It's a, it's a reality in a process. And then the second coming is a higher consciousness receiving and sanctifying that as we go through this process of climbing this ladder of sanctification, whether we want to think of it as a Jacob's ladder or whether we not we want to think of it as a ladder of the Beatitudes that help us to, to climb the mountain uh, of, of, of virtues and, and, and such, we, there's still this movement uh, that, that we participate in that, that culminates in second comings. That as the consciousness uh, moves higher, then our realization of that inner presence grows within us as well. And as we become sanctified, we realize the presence has already been there, whether we want to call it the light of Christ or whatever, whatever name we want to give to it. For, for us, these are essential parts of our being, but we're, we're not awake yet. Uh, Sufis could summarize the entire process with this ladder of sanctification motif in two words that the divine gave personally to all humanity through the first humans. Wake up and rise up. Wake up and rise up. So looking at the title of the book I mentioned, I see two things. First, I had the title right, The Second Coming of Christ. What I didn't remember is the subtitle, which is The Resurrection of the Christ Within You, which actually goes deeper than what I suggested when I was uh, going from memory, right? It's the resurrection, the, the waking up and the rising up of the Christ within you, not some external Christ, but the Christ within you. That, that, that is in, in, inextricably a part of our being. In other words, inextricably in that we can't analyze it adequately to break it apart and study it. We can't, uh, we can't uh, divide it. We can't slice it. We can't dice it. We can't separate it. We can't. And so, so it's, it's not that it hasn't already been there, right? The, the entire thing. But as he said, resurrection would mean to breathe to breathe life back into, right? Surar or susurrar in Spanish, right? This whispering or breathing, breathing and resurrection has that notion of putting the light, the breath back into something. And so it's like breathing life into what we already have. So we can, we can, as Christ himself said, we can let that light increase within us or it can become darkness. And if it becomes darkness, then, which isn't a real thing, it's an absence of light, right? If it becomes darkness. How great is that darkness? Because we have extinguished through the ego self, through, through you know, allowing it to have full reign in our lives, we have allowed ourselves to, to uh, extinguish to some degree or to cover with a bushel or to, right? We've, there's many metaphors that are used right. for that. Of course, all the darkness in the world can't really, you know, how is it St. Francis put it again? It can't really extinguish the light of a single candle, he says, but it can cover it up with a bushel, right? It can veil our eyes from the light in some sense. So I'm okay at this point in this conversation if the answer is no, Master, but is there an actual etymological connection between resurrection and susurrar? I, they sound I think there is, yeah. Related. yeah, yeah. I, I, okay. I, I, I don't know if that's a Latin-based term or what that came from. I should be careful with that, but then again, I don't care. <laughs> there is for me. <laughs> so the answer is yes, I just said it. And I said it from my soul and my experience and therefore it's true. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what else to say on that score. Give, given, well, and these things resonate in that way, right? With, with you and me, and they may not resonate with our listener, right? But they do with, and, and who knows, maybe the, the Latin in you and the Latin, and the Latin in me is why that resonates, but it doesn't matter. And, and so why not read Yogananda? 
and listen to what Yogananda has to say on the subject. See, this, this is why the, the, the three books, again, are the Book of Creation, which we've talked about briefly here today. The, the second are the wisdom and scriptural writings of great, of great persons, great spiritual persons or prophets, or we accept all of these things. We accept all of them for the wisdom they contain, not for the external theology we might debate about, not for dogmatic assertions, but for we accept them for, for that. And then, of course, the Book of Self. And I think Yogananda fits, for me, very squarely in that wisdom tradition. I can read and, and, and learn. And it's not that we accept them for any uh, of the dead letter in any sense, but rather for the living word of God that we find within them when we read them, or that we find within us, I should say, when we read them. In ourselves, I should say. Yes. In our souls. I think the deepest penetration is, is the soul and the intelligence. Whatever, because the, so, the soul, for me as a Sufi, is an awakened intelligence. The intelligence has always existed, but its consciousness was self-contained. And what the divine did to make a, our first soul level, uh, not living soul, which I think has to do with the body being a adhere to it but but that first soul attachment so to speak or soul realization is wake up and in each level of existence i would say in the more in the mortal realm so that uh, sort of a, a prior realm than a mortal realm and who knows what's coming afterwards i think there's always an awake uh, an awakening and a rising up and and we 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 grow in 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 power uh, uh, and purity of being, because we can achieve a new level of of awakening. We can re- achieve a new level of rising up, and so there is no end. If you want to call that glory, which means you know basically brilliant light, uh, or something like that. If you want to call that glory, then w- why not be able to increase in glory? Uh, as a as a perpetual spiritual undertaking that there is no there is no end result to it and that's the divine saying you look at my works there's no end you can't number them i can and i know them all and and so there there are these other levels so it occurs to me sheikh from the from what you've said or what you've emphasized in the verse about sanctification, about it happening through God himself and also at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that there is this concept, this Sufi concept of fana, that is this release from the ego self that we could be looking at in this verse at two out of three levels, right? There's this fana or or release from the ego self through a sheikh, that would be you, uh, a master, right? Through a rasul, which we could say is Jesus, right? Jesus is a prophet. Uh, I know that we we don't tend to think of Jesus that way in our tradition. In the Islamic tradition, he's said to be a prophet. But it turns out in our canon, he is also said to be a prophet. Jesus is a prophet. And then, of course, through uh, through Allah, through God himself. The three levels. Those are the three levels of, of I, can I say levels? Levels of extinction or release of the ego self? Yeah, I think that three three ongoing modalities of release might be a good way to put it because we don't uh, the sufi ar- arc of descent ascent and descent concept is that we can move through all of these but we often c- we come back to the earth and we bring it with us and so it's, a, it's an ongoing cycle of of rising up and then finding ourselves back in 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 this reality but it, we're not the same having risen up we don't we don't come back to where we were we can't because we're now uh, internally changed and so it's it's this dynamic. I imagine this is why you're teaching too, right? It, because I'm reminded of Plato's cave, right? Plato, when he goes out of the cave and he learns something, he actually goes back into the cave to teach it, and and he and he tells us, right, that it's it's our responsibility once we have been illuminated, right, that that we share the light, that we that we share that with others. So can I am I understanding this correctly that? If they're not really levels, right? It's not that I have to go through Fanafi, Sheikh, Rasul, Allah in some kind of order, but uh, because I feel like in my own experience that I've had glimpses, uh, experiences, you know, here and there of some or all of the above in no particular order. And so it could be something like the stages of grief, right? We, we have these stages of grief and we go through them, we say all of them, but we don't go through in any order and we don't go and touch on each one of them only once. We sort of cycle through them. 
I think it's a great metaphor or analogy for that because, you know, having experienced exceptionally deep grief in my life, I mean, the grief that I thought would swallow me whole and destroy me, I mean, very deeply grieving, uh, I, I know that that doesn't go away. I may find myself, I don't know, having a conversation. All of a sudden, I'll break down weeping. I have to go in the bathroom and lock the door and just sob. And why? I don't know. And some say, well, you're back at whatever. And I'm going, well, well who cares? I'm, uh, look, the process of, of working through this is what I need to be doing. So the levels are just ways of talking about things, ways of focusing our attention, or ways of, uh, of assigning practices by a master or whatever. They're just... That's why modalities might be a, a really good way to understand this process. And uh... So the, the question then becomes one of what does it mean to seek release from the ego self through a master, through a prophet, through God That's himself? That's a great way of putting it. Um, well, I, I meant to ask you, master. <laughs> All right, let's talk about this. Why do we have a master-disciple relationship in almost every mystical tradition? Whether it's Native American, shaman, whatever, or whether it's, it's uh, a, a guru, or whether it's, there's, they, they have these relationships. And it's, uh, how, how, how am I gonna put this? Uh, there's a certain resistance in the age of do-it-yourself to adopting someone to help guide, especially another person. And I don't blame a lot of people for this too, because no matter how long you move through that uh, sheikh, meaning a master, fanat, right, releasing the ego, fi sheikh, through a sheikh, through a master, uh, that that one level or, or, or modality we can talk about, uh, because you're going to learn a lot about each other, and so there has to be a, a great deal of trust, and that takes often time more time for some people and and i have some students that finally will just basically say it's not that they don't trust me i've had one student say that uh for example that they were traumatized they say i was traumatized by being a, a mormon woman and the fact that you are a mormon man and you're still active in the church even though you're a sufi guide i can't do that anymore and i go okay can i help you find another guide maybe we'll find a female guide that in the, in our order that is not uh, uh, from an LDS background, maybe from a, I don't know, a Buddhist background or no particular background at all. Can we, would you like to have a, a different guide? And so we always understand that, that this is um, a personal relationship. And you and I know that in our relationship, it, it, it can come to tug and pull sometimes. It's not like it's always, you know, peace, love, and harmony because our project is a serious one for both of us. And we have to we have to try and engage that, and often we, don't, we say things that we don't really intend or they're interpreted in the wrong way. And, and so, but, but at the end, we come back to the fact that we have that trust ongoing and we have love. So it has to be a loving relationship as master and disciple, and, and we, need to, we need to find a way to work on fina'a within that loving relationship relationship which has some intimacy to it that must be really hard for you master it's with not me. <laughs> it's not <laughs> and and you know it's well it, it has been hard for me when you've revealed my ego to me and i i remember mistaking that's a that's with a question mark who knows who cares here's what i learned so okay so you reveal my ego to me and i think well that's actually his ego he's revealing and then I talk to my friend and my friend who says, well, maybe he's more of a master than you realize and he's doing this on purpose. And I say, no, it's not him. But then God is. So what? Who cares, right? I mean, the point is, whether it's fanafi sheikh, fanafi fillah, right? You know, whether it's through my master or through God or both working together, whether they realize they're working together or not. I know God realizes it. Who knows if my master does? Who knows if I know what's going on? I don't think I do. But I tell you what. My ego was revealed to me in such a way that, I mean, how can I seek a release from my ego if I can't even recognize it? I have to see it as somehow distinct from my true self. You have to, it's, it's a consciousness. We develop an ego consciousness, we would say, just as we develop a, a God consciousness. It's a, it's a movement of our consciousness along this, this pilgrim's path. 
so that we begin to, to see all of these things. And it can be painful at times, and it can be, but, but if there's love behind it, then it's going to work, right? If, if, if we ultimately want to come around to say, well, no matter what happens in, along the path between a master and disciple, I mean, there obviously are ethical restraints on what the relationship can be, right? It can't be a, an improper relationship of any kind. But I, I would just suggest that that's a, that's a point where the, the master w- sometimes doesn't always know ahead of time what they're doing, but the response comes from what they see and what they feel and what their soul tells them. It occurs to me that what we're saying here aligns with Paul again, because Paul teaches us that when all is said and done, right, when, when the dust settles, all that remains is love. It's the reality of our existence because it's the thing that attaches us one being to another. Otherwise, we're just radically alone. We're just, we're just it's, boy, talk about a lone and dreary existence. Uh, that would be the loneliness. So love is the bond. And uh, whether, it's, uh, whether it's Paul in Hebrews 12 saying, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame thereof, because he saw the joy. For the joy set before him, he endured what he endured. When you spoke of the lone and dreary world, uh, I thought of Hobbes and his nasty, brutish, and short life, and I thought, maybe he was lonely. Maybe that's his problem. He needed, he was he needed someone to love. That's a, yeah, we can, we can go back to that old uh, Jefferson Airplane song. Don't you want somebody to love? Don't you need somebody yes. to love? Yeah. Uh, oh, if we're going to songs, I was going to say, all you need is love. I remember uh, talks given from the pulpit that said, that's not true. All you need in love is not true. And the course of my life has taught me it's absolutely true. It's the only thing I need. Because what we would call the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is love. What we would call the creation of this existence is love. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. Or I was a hidden treasure and I I loved to be known. Absolutely. Absolutely. The reason for the creation in that's the first exactly place. That's exactly correct. And that's why, uh, as, as Sufis, we go back to Rahman and Rahim as the core first, uh, 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 the nearest names we would call it, the most proximate names for the divine meaning, love, right? Uh, either. Well, and you say nearest, most proximate. I mean, we're talking about the womb. You're talking about an, a love that, if I can make up a word, is emwombment. That sounds pretty awesome to me. <laughs> That's pretty good love. So let's go a little bit into this. Uh, may, uh, is it back to First Thessalonians five twenty three text, not back to anything, but but re- touchstoning the text one more time. Uh, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the end of that verse, and and let's talk about fi Rasul, which is the Arabic for the 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 uh, release from the ego self that we find through a a messenger, a, a prophetic figure. When, this means by messenger, what we mean is one who left us something in writing, that we need to make something living within ourselves, a message that comes inside. I can think of many examples of how this has been my experience through Jesus Christ. And, and that's because I was taught by my mother, right, from, from my youth, right? To, to seek and to and to find to understand to to notice right when this is happening it was a little more of a challenge to experience it through another prophet so if I think of my experience of the revelation and subsequent release of my ego self through the prophet Muhammad for example where I've been raised in this tradition that somehow doesn't see the prophethood of Muhammad and yet, you know, I become a Latter Day Saint. I have prophets in my restored, you know, tradition telling me that the Prophet Muhammad is a prophet, right? And I'm not talking about Spencer Kimball. I'm talking. I'm going all the way back to 
George Albert Smith or is it George A. Smith or are they the same person? There's I, an I elder George sure A. Smith things. and it's the president George Albert Smith and they get we get confused. And and well, whichever one it is, he spoke right before Parley P. Pratt and they both spoke on the prophet Muhammad and called him a prophet. In uh, This can be found in the Correct. Journal of Discourses. Uh, at least if you look under the old spelling, right? M-A-H-O-M-E-T, Muhammad, right? And And so... That opened me up. My my Middle East studies and Arabic degree at BYU and the the openness that there was there. And I came to realize that the Prophet Muhammad not only functions in the same way as Jesus as a model of a perfect human being, and whether regardless of historicity of on, on the part of either man, right? Because Jesus was a man. That is that is actually emphasized in our canon, and. And I come to the place where I realize not only does he function that way for pious Muslims, but can function that way for me too. And the experience that I had of going into a biography of, of the Prophet Muhammad by Martin Lings, right, who's a Sufi, right, a Shakespeare scholar, great writer, writes this, what I'm going to call the ultimate hero's journey um, exposition of the life of the Prophet. And it's just such a beautiful experience, and it, and it teaches me so much about what is a true self versus an ego self in myself as well as in in the prophet or those around him it, it's instructive right it's it's one more revelation of my ego and release from it to some degree through a prophet and you know that joseph smith was uh, contemptuously named a uh, the yankee muhammad right yeah and and, right. and we have one source uh, I think it's a diary entry by someone else who said that when they brought that up in his presence, he said, well, Muhammad, I'm paraphrasing here, but Muhammad was it was a, a man who tried to uh, serve his community and God and tried to bring understanding and light uh, into that community. And if that's the case, then I am a Yankee Muhammad. You know, yeah, I'm trying to bring light and, and truth and and to my community. And, and so there is at least one indication that he he was good with it. In other words, it didn't bother him to say, well, Muhammad's not a prophet. He didn't go into dogma or doctrine or theology. He just said, hey, if that's what a prophet does, I'm good. It occurs to me, too, that, you know, as I, I mentioned Martin Ling's biography of the prophet Muhammad as a hero's journey, I called it a, a hero's journey. I, I don't, I mean that in the best possible way, right? I don't mean to disparage the the, the writing in any sense or the or the life of the prophet himself. It's the same, uh, we could call it in some sense a hagiography, right? That would be somewhat cynical, right? To say that that he wasn't saintly or holy, right? Um, it, but I'm just, I want to compare it to the hymn praise to the man. I think that the prophet Joseph Smith can function for us in the same way uh, in this, in terms of fanat fir rasul, right? This ego revelation and release through a prophet through a song like praise to the man. And, and we don't mean he's a god. Some people might hear that and say, oh, you really are worshipers of Joseph Smith. And we're going, no, this is an exemplar. This is a model. This is someone who brought a great message. This is someone who has, has been able to touch my soul. This is someone who, and, and we have that opportunity to do it. And as a Sufi, I would say, why not see that side of Joseph Smith? Of course he was a human being. And of course he, he made these errors. Right, we don't mean to imply, right, we don't mean to imply that, that he wasn't tempted or that he even as Jesus himself was tempted or that he even even that he didn't succumb to temptation uh, or that Muhammad didn't right that's not the point the point is how can because that's just my ego blaming right <laughs> that's just I my ego blaming him because uh, he did whatever right. and so he's out and it isn't we listen to him it's just like I don't even have to read him I don't have to regard him I don't have to see some wisdom in it and we do the same thing with whoever I mean we know that people are people and it, and we would all rather uh, any serious person would all rather be a better person and so we if I want the right to make an honest mistake so to so to speak I need to give that right to everybody else right uh, and if I and if I needed a a perfect sheikh, then I would have a really hard time finding one because they're all human beings, and so are the prophets, and so was again even Jesus Christ. Our our tradition actually emphasizes that right. in our canon, right? 
Uh, we think of it another way, and that's fine too. And we can think of it both ways, right? But he was, in fact, yes. a man. And then there's, and then there's through God, which of course we haven't come to. But I can see now here: May the God of peace Himself sanctify correct. you correct. entirely. So that's fanat fi Allah, right? That is correct. And we're gonna we're gonna come to that one. I do want to make another point about uh, Jesus here, really quickly, as we move on to fanat fi Allah in our conversation. Which uh, uh, so I I just want to stop here for a second and say, you know, we have a, a, a scriptural verse that that says that Jesus learned by the things which He suffered which is a very mystical concept. How do we learn? We learn by what we suffer. Now, we can say that suffering was, was only uh, physical suffering, but I don't think that's the case with Jesus because he couldn't fully understand this if there weren't some deeper experience. And, and it says, yet without sin. So what it tells me is perhaps, and I'm going out on a limb here, but per- perhaps it involves mistakes, errors, uh, it talks about him growing up in that way, and and so, but then but they're not sin. They don't they don't maybe involve an intentionality. They don't maybe maybe they're just the natural learning processes that we all go through. To where mom says don't touch the hot stove. God says don't touch another person's body in certain ways. We could say there's these commandments, yet we do touch the we do touch, and uh, so at any rate. Uh, I just want to give you my full Sufi name. And we'll end it. We'll end it with here. Um, my my full Sufi name is Sufi Al Hajj Dawood Al Isawi, and that Isawi on the end of that is Isa, which you know means Jesus, and so in Arabic. So my full name would be David the Sufi Pilgrim, a, a, a disciple of Jesus. So for me, my Fanat Fi Rasul takes place as I work with with Jesus. And we know that Ibn al-Arabi, the great Sheikh al-Akbar, the, the master of masters, said his first master was Jesus, that Jesus came to him and started him as a young man on the Sufi path. He didn't have a living master in that sense. He And he didn't have Muhammad. He Jesus, Jesus. Then Muhammad comes in. But Jesus, Jesus was, well, that doesn't mean he abandons Jesus. Don't, well, let's not say it's one or the other. It's not an either-or proposition. It's a cumulative. But maybe Vivek, uh, maybe uh, Vivekananda is one of my, one of mine that comes into me. Or, or uh, I love uh, the Chuangzi tradition in Taoism. Maybe Chuangzi's writings, because he's a messenger. He wrote something down, supposedly. I mean, we always have questions about provenance of text, but, but, but uh, I, I can read that, and and why not him? So. We have some members of our order that are Musawi, meaning they follow Musa. They're from a Jewish order, a Jewish religious background. And so Moses, Musawi. There is a distinction that occurs to me to make. And, and of course, this is based on my understanding. And please correct me if I'm wrong. But I have teachers, uh, people I consider to be my teachers I've never met on YouTube. I listen to their lectures. I learn from them. This functions in some way like a Rasul. I don't think, even though I, these are living persons, I could meet and may meet, and some of them I have met. And yet, they're not like a master in this conversation. They're more like they're more like a, a Rasul, right? They're more like a messenger or a prophet. Because I, I do think, in my experience, a, a master is someone who I do know intimately and who knows me intimately and who we work together as you've already explained right and and that that's different from learning from someone through a book or through a youtube video a prophet from the past a lecturer from afar right you're even though you're uh, far away right you're in in idaho i'm in california and yet we see each other face to face thanks to modern technology and you're coming to see me for the second time. And how long have we known each other? Just over a year or so. And and we're also, you know, getting together face to face. And you've come all the way to me. This will be the second time you come all the way to me to teach me. And I'm grateful for that. The commitment, Sufi initiatory commitment. You know, it's not a ritual like baptism, but an initiation. I do meditate upon you and our character and our relationship, and I give you a Sufi name. And I initiate you onto the Sufi path, but it's really a powerful commitment for me. I don't try to undertake it lightly, 
because what it means is I will be there. And, and I never sought to be a Sufi master. My master one day said, okay, you need to be a teacher. You need to be a Sufi master. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to initiate you in our order. And I said, well, <clears throat> what exactly is it I need to do to teach and all the rest of it? He said, when you're a teacher, you go off and teach. Yeah, but we, you don't, you, you have whatever needs to, your curriculum is whatever you need to do to help your, your disciples, your students along the way. And you don't have to report back to us. We're, we, we're not going to double check your theology and your dogma. We're not going to have a, a ward conf, conference or we're not going to have a state conference and authority is going to come in and double check you. Now, I'm not saying that's cynical or how I view those things because an institutional church needs to, be, to do things differently. But I'm saying it, within the Sufi system, when you, are, when you are initiated to teach, then you teach. Let's, uh, let's uh, take a moment then and... and and just talk about Fenet Fischek and Fenet Rasul in a broad way as to the ego. The ego we, we see in Sufism is not something to be despised or something to be, well, in our path, and, and for me, it, not something to be despised or something to be truly annihilated, except we want to, to, to release, be released from its dominating influence. So it isn't something we have to hate. Uh, the ego is a part of us. It's part of why we're here in mortality, is to develop this, this ability to act in the world, the ability to present ourselves in the world. So instead, it's a process of, if you will, working on the influence of the ego as a dominating influence in our life. Uh, and then uh, we'll talk about when we get to Fanat Fi Allah a little more fully here in just a second, we'll talk about what that really means. But... Uh, it occurs to me that this this ego self that you say we're not going to actually annihilate, as sometimes we hear said, and and not to point the finger at another tradition, but that's that's kind of the the verbiage that I've heard in in another. And tradition. I use it sometimes too, and yet but I don't really mean it. Even in our tradition, okay, yeah. So I don't think that's it. We can pin it on any tradition. It's just a manner of speaking, but it isn't really entirely literally accurate, right? Because what we're not what we're talking about doing is integrating. As, as though uh, it were shadow work in, in a Jungian sense, right? The, the, we're going to take, and you and I have talked about, I think even on this podcast, the idea of shaitani, right? My Satan, uh, that, that is a part of me, right? And how the Prophet Muhammad himself was asked, do you have a Satan? Because maybe people thought, they're asking this question, because, well, surely you don't have a Satan, right? No, I have a Satan, he says. I've just made him a Muslim, meaning I have made him submit to God. That means Muslim means one who submits to God. And so it's a matter not of annihilating, of getting rid of, of denying in any sense of pushing away. Actually, pushing away, as I understand it, is what is meant by shadow self, right? It's, it's rather loving and accepting fully all the parts, to put it in uh, internal family systems terms, right? All the parts. Um, maybe as Elizabeth Gilbert put it in, I think it was, it was a TED Talk, or maybe it was, she was talking about her book, Big Magic, but she mentions that I think she was talking about fear, actually, but you can see it as, as something like this ego self, right? That it can come on the road trip. It just can't sit in the front seat. It can't choose the radio station, right? It can just sit in the back seat quietly. But of course it can come along. That's a part of me. But it doesn't lead. It doesn't drive the car. It doesn't choose the radio station. It doesn't even ride shotgun. Uh, well, and I think that's a great metaphor, but I would tell you as a Sufi, sometimes it does need to drive the car. Under the direction of the soul. You're, you're, you sit shotgun and teach it how to drive. But you understand what I'm getting at is I would take it even a, a little further and say it, 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 it's, it's a matter of the domination of, of the ego. It's a matter of its dominating influence. So the process of integration is eventually you're going to become one driver. Does that, does that make sense? But your soul is at the wheel at all times. I like what you did with my metaphor or Elizabeth Gilbert's metaphor. Well, so let's talk about that for just a second. So for Fanat Fi Sheikh, the master, Fanat Fi Rasul, the messenger, this, this sort of release from, release from the ego self is a great phrase for those. And the second coming of Jesus Christ, the, well, not second coming, but the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ as an internal matter comes from me really 
paying a lot of attention to what Jesus said and did. So I spend a lot of time in scripture that deals with what Jesus said and did. Those would be release from the domination of the ego self. Then, but fanat fi Allah, that last step, that is the divine pulls you right up to the very top. The last thing you can't do, which can't really be put into words, but is understood through spiritual practices and a, a refined knowledge gained personally through your life experiences, is that knowledge we call ma'arifa. And we see it in many places in translations of LDS scripture. Uh, we see it in uh, Ether 3, right about verses, I don't know, 19, 20, 21, in the Arabic translation, where it says that, that uh, the brother of Jared had a perfect understanding, and because of that perfect understanding, he could not be kept from within the veil. What strange language. He could not be kept from within the veil. God couldn't keep him out. And so that, that translation of that knowledge is ma'arifa. Ma'arifa kalima. It's a perfect, perfect understanding, which means whole and entire and complete. It, and that word ma'arifa is used. So, so as we, in the Arabic translation of the Book of Mormon, and so as we begin to grow in ma'arifa through releasing ourselves from the domination of the ego self, we come to the absorption of the ego by and through the divine. So that if the, if the ego were a layer of our being. It can be hard. It can be, some say, calcified. It can be thick. We can build it up as a shell around our soul so that the wounds of the world don't come in, but then our spirituality can't grow. It's like we're entombed in our own, in our own stone self. Uh, this is the stony tablets of the heart. Well, that's, that's again pushing, right? Pushing out. I'm not going to allow anything in. Right, that's the that's the ego, yeah. Only the divine can reach through that last veil and take us into the divine presence. And and our ego is fully absorbed. It becomes a part of our soul, a part of our being. Our life experiences are beautiful and we want them to be there. Can I now go through the verse again and bring all of these modalities, fanafi sheikh, fanafi rasul, fanafi Allah, in, into the verse? I don't think I can do this the way I usually do, where I plug them mm -hmm. in because of the way the verse is written. But let me just try to read. I'll read the verse again and then put it in the other terms separately. May the God of peace sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So through a Sufi lens, may you be sanctified through God, shows up first in this verse, entirely. He's the only one who can sanctify us entirely. Himself, that's right, entirely. Also, Firasul, right, through a prophet, through Jesus Christ, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, which again, we can read in Yogananda's terms as the second coming of Christ within us or the coming or resurrection of the Christ within us, right? And then finally, through... I'm looking for a sheikh oh, here uh, in this for verse. Me, for for me, it's, I'm trying to help your spirit and your soul and body be kept sound and blameless. Ah. I give you exercises. I give you I actual things to do and things to read and things to... So I'm kind of there helping you figure out how to keep your soul and your, your body and your spirit... Uh, sound and blameless, right? So that means free from ego domination. Sound and blameless to me means free from mm. ego domination. So I actually see all three of them in there. That's just me. I, again, I'm not saying Paul said that, but that's what I say. And if I say it for my soul in, in my experience, then that's what we all say, I guess. <laughs> I can see that. Yeah, this is one One verse. tiny little snippet that we'd probably just Think, oh, he's just blessing us. Peace be upon you. May God keep you. Okay, thank you. Amen. We're done. And right. I'm going, there's an entire mind to be plumbed its depths and the beautiful treasure hidden in the field to be extracted, the pearl of great price to be f discovered and in, in diving into the depths of this ocean of, of the divine. There's a whole universe in this verse. This All this... The whole Sufi culture, the whole path, all of it, 
in one verse. You chose well, my friend. Beautiful verse. And I, I'm... S- well, I didn't know what I was <laughs> doing. Well, I think you did, but you didn't know, you didn't know that you knew <laughs> what you were doing. Uh, uh, so uh, the resonance is the path. You resonated. You said, I want to do this one. And uh, so I want to thank you because I've gained a great deal out of this conversation. As we say, the disciple makes the master. I thank you. The master makes the disciple. I don't know who said okay. that. I said and that. And if you said it from your soul and, and through your own experience, then that's what I say. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, I will uh, look forward then to our next conversation and uh, see you next week, friend. Yes, see you next week. Peace be with you. Ma salama. Thank you for listening to Latter-day Contemplation Presents Come Follow Me. Once again, I'm your co-host, Christopher Hurtado. Please also consider listening to Latter-day Peace Studies' other podcasts I co-host, Latter-day Contemplation, offering a contemplative approach to discipleship, and Latter-day Peace Studies Presents Come Follow Me, offering nonviolent historical critical exegesis of Latter-day Saint scripture at www.latterdaypeacestudies.org. Once again, I'm Dr. David Peck. Please also consider listening to my other podcast of Saints and Sufis, Musings of a Mormon Mystic, offering Sufi meditations and commentary through my The Truth of Jesus is Himself series at www.daviddpeck.com. Thank you for co-hosting this podcast with me, Sheikh Daoud. Thanks also to Latter-day Peace Studies all-volunteer team for editing, publishing, and promoting this podcast on social media. Finally, Thanks to our audience for listening and responding to this podcast and for donating to Latter-day Peace Studies, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. All of your donations are tax-deductible and go toward producing, publishing, and distributing content. And thank you for co-hosting this podcast with me, Abdelhop. Till next week. <laughs>